Well, listen, Jamie, thanks for, for joining us. I, I was just telling Robbie just before you joined us, I was listening to the Greatest Game podcast. Very well done on that, by the way. I was listening to the episode with yourself and Robbie. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously, our job is to make sure over the course of the next hour we don't repeat anything that you boys had a good natter about. But you enjoy the pod. I mean, you're the busiest man in show business. I said it. Yeah, at this moment, I am. People can't get enough of me. It'll, uh, it'll soon change. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to... Uh, do as much as I can get to get the, the few quid in at the moment, but, but no, I, I the, the podcast was uh, basically. I mean, I, I give my opinion on TV or uh, a newspaper column, so I wanted to do something where I was asking the questions basically and and trying to get better at that because that's something I do a little bit in my role when we we get players in and we, we speak to them and ask questions. So almost just listening to other people's stories or basically look, looking back at their career really and have a little bit of fun with it little bit of a laugh and a joke but mainly it's, it's about them as opposed to sort of my podcast as such it, it's more about the people that we get on and and their opinions basically and that's why we got uh, we got god on uh can yeah we and can we'll we'll just inspired him yeah you're not wrong i know you're, you're not you're not you're not wrong Karen, what's what's the story behind it though do you do you look into obviously great games or do you look into the players and ask them to pick their particular games yeah so i get in touch with them before and so i uh yeah, I mean, it was almost, it needs the name or it needs a hook, if you like. So we speak about the career, it can go in any direction. But basically, we finish off by best five-a-side team and greatest game you've ever played in or watched. So that gets us into, you know, great players and great games that you can, you know, go a little bit deeper, depending on their uh, their answer, basically. So beforehand, I always know what their greatest game is, not the five-a-side team, but it's just so I don't... Uh, we don't we, we talk we don't talk about a game halfway through that they're then going to talk about at the end. So that's the the giveaway. They have to let me know the, the greatest game. So don't uh, step on the toes halfway through. But that, that's a, that's about it. I wouldn't say I do massive prep for it in terms of knowing everything about them. I just start an interview with the, with the obvious things and then sometimes just jump on what the the uh, the person I've got in says really and just see where it goes and where it takes us and just kind of a laugh and a laugh and a joke basically and then finish with the the greatest game. Can I, 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 I sorry Chris I won't put I'll just throw it on your toes here but you know maybe swing it full circle here. What would be your greatest game? And I don't want you to go sort of go into it too much but you know if it's just on the uh, on the cusp of your your brain now what would it be? Off the top, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's the obvious one, isn't it, with, with Istanbul? But if you, if you take that sort of uh, out of it, uh, I'd probably say two that I, I would toss up, and, and one would be my full debut that I played alongside you in. I think we both scored in that game. We and uh, could have been any game that, can I? <laughs> <laughs> no, that couldn't have been any game, but we both scored. I, can I know you. that. Uh, you know, my debut for Liverpool scoring at the cop at 18. And if that game doesn't happen, where does your career go, basically? Uh, so I, I always think of that one. And possibly one of the semi-finals against Chelsea in, two, I'd, I'd say, 2005. I think, Robbie, you were involved in, in the 07 one. I think you took yeah. a penalty in that, in that one. But I'd possibly say the 05 one, it was the first time we'd been there. Great Champions League, running the rivalry with, with Chelsea. And for us, uh, you know, my, my era, that was our... You know what, what the lads had against Barcelona, this team now, or what the, you know the sixties team had against. Uh, I think it was Inter Milan, and I think in the seventies we had Saint Etty, and that really famous European night, and and that was our one really at uh, at Anfield. So I, I'd say Chelsea two thousand and five at home. I want to, if I if I can, Jamie, uh, it's gone viral. You've got a feeling, is what you said in midweek, I think, after that win against RB Leipzig. Do you still have that feeling? Are Liverpool winning the Champions League this season? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think they will. Uh, I think they're probably just a little bit short defensively uh, at this moment. And the reason I said that, I mean, I was just, you know what, I was just excited that Liverpool has won the game. I mean, Robbie was <laughs> the same boat as me. You want to see your, your former team do well. And we're so used to it and being spoiled the last three years where they almost win every game that when they've gone so long without winning, just to win a game gives you a nice little buzz and a nice little feel. And I think I was just playing up to the cameras and the fact that Michael Richards is on my left and we keep winding him up that uh, Man City haven't won the Champions League yet, even though they are big favourites uh, this season. But but I think if the draw goes well for Liverpool, I mean, you're into it, you could get into a semi-final, basically. And then, as I said, you're that close. It's a cup competition. The Champions League, for me, has never been... What's well, I say it's never been. It's... 
it doesn't necessarily mean you're the best team in Europe if you win it, because we were a million miles away from being the best team in Europe in 2005. I mean, I think Barcelona and Real Madrid over the last say, decade have been the best teams in Europe, and they've dominated the competition, I think, by Munich last season. But you have to remember, it is a cup competition, and anything can happen. So like in, in England, the, you know, if you win the FA Cup, it doesn't mean you're the best team in the country. Really, so I mean, Liverpool still have a chance because it's a cup competition. But I do think City and Bayern Munich are ahead of Liverpool at this moment. But they could meet each other in the next round. That's, that's the beauty of, of cup football. Well, you, Carrie, you said that you just mentioned they're not necessarily the best team will win the uh, the competition. Uh, think back at maybe a few years ago when Liverpool played City in the um, I think it was in the quarters, wasn't it? It was. Uh, yeah. And obviously uh, Liverpool ended up beating them, but Liverpool never went into that game as favourites. So just that obviously potentially shows you that. You know, you are a good team, but you know what? Depending on what happens in that particular day or that, that particular uh, two legs, uh, just just well, it, well, it makes your season or whatever. I don't really know, but that that can basically tell you what uh, what type of game you're having. Yeah, I think Liverpool. I think the crowd's a big miss. I think if Liverpool had the crowd, even though they had the injury problems they've got now, but I think if they had the Anfield crowd as well, I think it'd make me feel more confident. I just think playing at Anfield is not being as intimidating for opposition. Obviously through lockdown, so that's been a problem for for Liverpool. So that makes me think it'll be even tougher, really. But as I said, I think going into the Champions League, I think the players will see it as a distraction from the league as well, because the league's been so poor. It's almost something different, and it's it's a competition where Liverpool excel in. And I was making this point on on the TV that uh, if if City played Liverpool in the next round or a semi final. There'd be more nerves from City just for the fact that it's in the Champions League. There's something about Liverpool in Europe, but it is special. And sometimes it's not just the quality on the pitch, it's it's your belief, it's your history in a competition. And I think Pep Guardiola mentions that a lot when he speaks about uh, you know Man City in, in Europe and people question him about winning the Champions League. And he talks about not having no history in it. And people may think, well, it's just your team on the pitch on the day. But I, I do get where he's coming from. But when you're actually play for a club who's he's got that history like Liverpool have and we did really well in the Champions League when I was a player but not so well in the Premier League and we've gone so long without winning it you always felt that extra more confidence and belief something would happen in Europe because the club had done that before and I think that's where City are at right now whereas at this moment they are the best team in Europe but if they played in Munich if they played in Liverpool if they maybe played in Real Madrid they may find it's more tougher than you'd expect because of the history of those clubs and, and the arrogance those clubs have in the European Cup. Uh, I just Karen, wonder no, no, on that. Go, go on, sorry, sorry Chris. No, 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 sorry, Rob, on you go. No, Karen, I was just going to say, obviously, you, you've just mentioned Liverpool about the Premier League and obviously the players have got and uh, the, the potential of the Champions League is huge. Now, we go on to, obviously, one of the players Liverpool have and, and it's fair to say, hasn't it, the ground running? Yeah, is obviously Thiago. And there's no doubt he is a class player. And I don't know whether he's still adapting to the, to the speed of the Premier League. Would he be, is he more suited to the Champions League? Than, yeah, I think that's that... pretty obvious. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, no, there's no doubt about that. When you, when you see him come in and, and you see him play, I actually feel sorry for him a little bit. I must say, because he's played two or three different roles within midfield. He's played the deepest position. Now he's playing a little bit higher. I thought he was very good against Leipzig. And you just think of that knock-on effect of having Fabinho next to him. And what what that will do to his games? I, I think Fabinho is as good as anyone in Europe in that yeah. position, the whole midfield role. And I think you saw a glimpse of what we could see from Thiago going forward. But I don't think we're going to necessarily see a completely different Thiago next season when everyone's fit and fired. And because I actually think he's had some really good games, but he's really good with the ball. He's not great without the. He's, he's not great with, uh, when he hasn't got the ball. And I don't think that's going to change. He gives silly fouls away. He's not great when the game gets stretched and the problem he's had is Liverpool games have become stretched a lot this season because they've been losing and that's been a problem they haven't got the first goal and the game gets stretched it goes end to end Liverpool are desperate to get into the game and you can see him trying to cover such a big area and he can't do it and that's not a criticism that's just a fact of what Thiago's like as a player and I think when you're not winning no matter how you play people don't ever say you've played well really and it was the first day, the first game against Leipzig in the same stadium, I actually got a newspaper column on the back of that, actually saying, it's funny now, people are saying Thiago played well in midweek, when in fact he played exactly the same. 
as he had been playing. It's just that Liverpool won, and people feel better. We, we're all more positive about things. You say, well, and even if someone has a bad game when you win, you say, yeah, but he gave it hundred percent, and he and he was there, and he and he done that well, and he done that well. Whereas when you get beat, everything's negative. We always look at the, the negative things, even though some things have been really positive. And I just think he wasn't someone to play every game, really, because Liverpool had a, a Champions League winning midfield, a Premier League winning midfield. He was he was brought in to add something to Liverpool's midfield. And the situation he's found himself in and the team is he's almost become a mainstay, really. And uh, but no, I agree, Robert. I think he'll uh, he'll come into his own in the Champions League. I, I really do. But I think the addition of Fabinho in midfield will, will provide a big help to him. Yeah, Rob's already said it, Jamie, that he is a class act. When Liverpool Football Club signed him, I thought to myself, that's the game changer. That will be the title heading back to Anfield. Obviously, other th- situations and injuries have impacted that. But when, when we go back to your own career, and, and this is a question as much for you, Robbie, as it is for you, Jamie. When players come into a football club, do you guys, and listen, Thiago is a class act. There's no suggestion here that he's a wrong in for that football club. But do you as players, do you quickly realise and quickly grow grasp who's a fit at a football club and who isn't can I go on do you know what I'm saying yeah 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 the things so. I mean a fit I mean it probably takes you a little while to see you know how we fit in as such but I think we're all pretty the same where we we judge new signings very quickly and maybe a little bit too harshly and that you probably give them a couple of weeks in training and you, you need to see something and the funny thing is in at Liverpool my experience tells me that if someone doesn't do well in the first four or five months, it very rarely turns around. And that's the opposite of what I hear people say on Sky when we talk about, you know, foreign players coming into England and taking a year to adapt and we'll see the best of them next year. And, and what makes me laugh is people always use Thierry Henry as an example about, you know, Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry scored 25 goals in his first season. It's like, it's like I need to tell everyone this, that he had a really good first season. He then became the best player in the world or the best player in the Premier League, but he was very good when he first came. And I think, as I said, sometimes we forget that. But I can't think of too many Liverpool players who signed for Liverpool and didn't do well in the first year and then had a, and then went from there. I, I, if I think of all the great foreign players, even including the, this team now, they all done it straight away. And the ones in, in our team that we played with, Robbie, was you know, was Sammy Ippia, Henshaw, Marcus Babbel, John Arna Risa, I'm just trying to think who else came in. Uh, you know, foreign players, Didi Man. Didi Man took a little bit of time to settle, and maybe he's the only one I'd really mention who was a markedly better, I would say, in year two. But uh, more often than not, the top foreign players, certainly at our club, I would say they did it right away. So you judge people harshly and quickly, but very rarely, I think, are you proven wrong. And what about you, Karen, in terms of when players come in and they're playing in your position? What what is your what is your mark with that one? Do you, do you compare yourself to them, or what what do you do to I don't know, say to the manager that I'm still the man to to play in that position? You know, is it your confidence? Is it what you do on the training pitch? Is it what you do in a game? Well, well, well for, for me, Rob, I had that a lot in my career where I was. I think the club, certainly in the early twenties, always felt they could sign someone better than me. Which is fine, and why not? It's Liverpool. They've got to be looking to, they've got to be looking to improve every position, and every year that that was my position. And I wasn't a typical. Listen, I did, I wasn't a fullback. I wasn't a fullback from a kid, and I made it for Liverpool. I became a fullback uh, because I couldn't get in the team at centre back at one stage. So they always felt they could buy archetypal fullbacks, if you like. And uh, but but I always knew. Not, not, not that I was better than them, because that we, I, we possibly had different qualities, but I knew those players coming in wouldn't be able to match my mental strength. I, just, I knew that for a fact. Uh, I knew they would be able to train the way I did every day. And uh, they probably wouldn't have my injury record, because I, I never missed training, I never missed games. And, and I think I wore players down, really, rather than actually being better than them quality-wise. I think I just wore them down through physical and mental strength every day on the training pitch and, you know, just being there every day. And I always felt if I did that every day, it's very difficult for a manager not to pick me. So, yeah, at times it gave me a few sleepless nights that maybe uh, I might have to move on at some stage. But I was I was very mentally strong. I think that's one of my biggest strengths as a footballer. 
you know, we, we all have different strengths and weaknesses, but one of mine was, was definitely me, me mentality, me focus, concentration, and, uh, you know, my mental toughness to deal with ups and downs of football and, and basically get through, get through tough times where I, where I thought other players may find that difficult. That's interesting you're saying that, Karen, because I, I obviously look and I train with you every single day. And one of the one of the, the endearing qualities you had more than anyone was your communication and your your attitude. You you, you never say that die attitude. Uh, now you get players who let, let's be honest are better than both of us who who uh, you can go and, I don't know dictate games or whatever they want to do. But whoever came into Liverpool in terms of what you had. I'm not sure any player did have that. Now, you've mentioned Sammy for yourself, you, the likes of Stefan on show, the likes of Marcus Babel, they're all good players and great players, but you, what you had ahead of them was the, your ability to, to organise, your ability to communicate, and your ability to bring out the best of, of the players around you. You had that, whereas a lot of players didn't have that, and I think that's probably what, what, what made you the player that you are. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Rob, that's my personality. That's just that's just me as a person. So the, the way I speak on a football pitch is the way I speak now in a television studio, the way I spoke when I first played football at six or seven years of age. I know I am a, a big character, a big personality. It's, it's not an it's not an act. That's just that's just me. If I whatever team I went into, I would be the dominant player with, with my voice. I just I, I whatever football team I played, and I always told other people what to do. And I, I could never accept someone telling me what to do. And that's not because I was a better player than them. That was just my character. That was my personality. I couldn't play any differently. Uh, so if I played with Virgil van Dijk now, I couldn't lace his boots as a footballer. But I would still be telling Virgil van Dijk where to go on the football pitch because that's that was me. And that's why I played at the level I played at, Rob, because in terms of natural ability, you think of you. I'm talking about local players now, yourself, Stevie Mach, Robbie, uh, Michael and say Stevie Gerrard, we're maybe seen as the, the real five of maybe the 90s who came through. I didn't have what you used to have. You were all superstars at 18, 19, and, and maybe the best player in the Liverpool team at, at 18, 19. But I wasn't, I, I was different. And the only reason I could play at that level is I had a, a mental strength, I just remember, I mentioned. But also organisation. But organisation comes from actually understanding the game. Yeah. There's no point to organising if you're talking rubbish, because sooner or later you'll be off the team if you're given wrong information. So my organisation skills came from the fact that I understood the game. So the reason I played at, at the level that, that you played at was because I think I was one of the best in terms of what was between my ears, in terms of reading the game, understanding the game, giving information, being mentally strong, whether that was overcoming injuries or playing on with injuries. So my actual footballing ability was, listen, I was a good player. I come through at Liverpool right the way through. But I think my footballing ability alone would have been bottom Premier League, top championship. But I think my actual, between me, between the ears, was maybe top notch. And that's what got me to sort of the level of play that. I, I think you you're might... probably doing yourself, a, sorry, Chris, I know you're trying to talk there, but I think you're doing yourself an injustice there, Karen, because when I obviously think about Liverpool and, uh, certainly being a young lad, so I think uh, at times fans can can get on our backs a little bit more because we because we're local players and they probably demand a little bit more from us at times. But one of the uh, things that strikes me about you is, uh, and I don't know what your opinion of this is. I think you mentioned before about you obviously you never really had injuries, but when you broke your leg, I reckon or I think you became a better player. Not not when you came back, but I, I just think people realised sort of how good you was and how sort of how good you was on a football pitch about communicating and, and demanding from everywhere else. Does that does that make sense? Or no, I think you're right, Rob. I think I, I say this a lot on TV that you always have your best games when you're not playing. <laughs> and that happens a lot. And I was never injured. I was always someone who played every single game. And sometimes, listen, you want to play every game, of course you do. But the more games you play, possibly the, the more bad games or mistakes you can make as well. I always liken it to a fact that when we sign players from other clubs who weren't used to playing European football. They, if they played well on a Saturday, they needed to. They didn't need that midweek game in the Champions League on the Tuesday. They needed to almost just relax and embrace exactly what they'd done on Saturday and, and enjoy it for four or five days. Whereas at Liverpool, it was like, well, no, you've got to play well again Tuesday, and then you've got to go again Saturday, and then we've got Carl and Cup, and it was just that constant game after game. And it, it was not a good thing to break your leg, but I think <clears throat> you're right. I think it maybe uh, 
did make people maybe appreciate me a little bit more because as I said, I wasn't I wasn't you banging goals in or I wasn't Stevie Gerrard in midfield. I was I was a good player who was always going to get better with experience and maturity, basically. And I, I always remember something Steve I always said to me as a youngster. He said, uh, he said, you'll play for the first team. You know, I've I've no doubt about that. He said, but you may have to be you may have to be a little bit patient and it may not happen at 18 like it did for Robbie or um, uh, Stevie Mack. Because normally, well, what he said was he said the two things that normally stand out for a player that get them in the first team as a youngster is, is blister and pace or they score goals. And it was always something that stuck with me because it, it's certainly none of them are my strengths. So, <laughs> but you think of yourself, you think of Michael with the pace, you know, Stevie Mack with the pace and ability, Stevie, you know, what a physical specimen. I, 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 I was up for it. I was aggressive and I was a fighter. But in terms of physicality, I'm not the tallest, I'm not the quickest, I'm not the strongest, really. So for me, I always had to be, you know, play the game basically in my brain to get to, to the level I basically got to. But being out at that time, yeah, I think it, it, it maybe did. But, you know, for me, I was basically playing in a position where I was a good Liverpool player as a fullback. I wasn't a great one. And I was never going to be a great Liverpool fullback. And basically, I had to fight for my life to stay at the club and play week in, week out until the time came when I was ready to play in my rightful position because we had some great centre-backs and also in, in Sammy Kipier and, and Henshaw, but also the fact that uh, centre-backs are position that you, it's a bit like a goalkeeper. You don't really want kids playing there. You don't want youngsters playing there and making mistakes. If, if, if you make a mistake or you have a bad game, you just get brought off. You, you, a striker can win you the game. You can't lose you the game. A defender can't win you the game. You can lose you the game. And that's why you saw this thing. So as a youngster, if you make mistakes in that position as goalkeeper or centre-back, you can really cost your team. So I had to sort of just bide my time till I got my chance at uh, to my mid-twenties, basically, for me, and my chance at centre-back and, and just stayed there then ever since. Well, you, Carrie, you just mentioned about obviously getting into the team. And um, I mean, I've got, I remember you as a kid and you obviously playing for various England teams and being at uh, the, you know, the, the, the Lilla Show. I mean, obviously you came through as a, loads of people will remember this, but you came through as a, as a centre midfielder, but then went on to play in, in various positions along the, on, along the back line, uh, left back, right back, centre half. What, what, what did you like as your favourite position? I know you just talked about obviously certain roles there, but what, what was your preference? Well, I actually joined Liverpool at, well, I was, I was a centre forward up until the age of 16. So I actually, my first game for Liverpool reserves was centre forward. So, you know, I was still a, I was still a striker. I was I was next in line after you both. There was a couple of injuries, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, was my, that was my first role. But my first year at Liverpool full-time, I'd, I'd played for England as centre-forward from 14 to 16. I joined Liverpool as, as a striker. But I was just... I knew I'd never had the, the pace or the ability to go past the man. I was, I was someone who was a, a number nine when I was a kid, scored... Goals broke all the records for you know junior teams and Bootle boys, Sefton boys. But I always wanted to play midfield because I always wanted to have a bigger involvement in the game. Just scoring wasn't enough for me when I was a kid. I wanted to be involved in everything, really. But obviously, I wasn't when I was 14 to 16. There was obviously better midfield players in England than me. So I was back to my centre forward role. So listen, I was I was I was seen as one of the best strikers in the country. But as I got to 14 to 16. I was more of a hold-up player and playing between the lines rather than being a number nine because I was a late developer physically. Uh, I was really quick when I was 10 or 11. That seemed to go or people develop quicker than me or stronger than me. So I become more of like a link player then. And then when I joined Liverpool, we were playing three at the back, if you remember, Roy Evans' team. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we uh, I came back to Liverpool, I, I started playing Macca's role, if you like, for the, for the, the B team. And then it, then it became centre midfield. So it was just slowly going further back. I played centre midfield in the Youth Cup, which we won. And I was playing for England then in centre midfield. And, and Ronnie Moran mentioned about me going to centre back because we lost our centre back, Eddie Turkington, in the semi final of the Youth Cup. He got sent off. So I went back there for the last 15 minutes and he was then suspended for the first leg of the final. And it wasn't like the academies now where they've got like a squad of 25. It was basically. 12 or 13 lads from Merseyside. One goes down. It's like you're bringing someone up from the year below. So there was no one else there. So I went centre-back for the first leg of the final. Played really well away at West Ham. We won 
against uh, Frank Lampard and Rio Ferdinand. And I stayed there ever since and, and just alternated them between centre back and centre midfield for the with the first team in my in my first year or two with the first team. Listening to you there, Jamie, and it was Stephen Gerrard, I think, in episode six that, that said he growing up wasn't like you. You were a stato. You know, you're exactly what you see on the TV is what you wear during your playing days. You talking about you couldn't lace, your words, you couldn't lace Virgil van Dijk's boots, but what you could do is you could tell him where to be. It lends itself to the question, Jamie, why never management for Jamie Carrier? It just, it, it never fell in my lap. I, I wasn't going chasing it because... Uh, I'd seen what management had done to, to the, the two biggest influencers on my career, Gerard Fulier and Rafa Benitez. The job at Liverpool had taken its toll on the two of them after six years at the club. I'd never moved, I'd never moved home. And, uh, you know, Robbie's obviously been all, all around the world, but I'm, more often than not, Liverpool lads are quite uh, home birds, shall we say. I started my badges and I was offered a job. I was offered two roles, basically, which if I'd have taken them, or it dematerialised. It'd been interesting to see where I would be now. But my 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 last season at Liverpool, I asked, would it be possible to shadow Steve Clark and Kenny in the pre-season? So I thought they would stay for my last season. They ended up getting obviously losing the jobs. But I thought, well, okay, to me last year, I've started my badges. What I didn't want to do was say, right, I'm going to become a coach or a manager. And then I become a coach, and after two or three weeks or a month, I go, I don't like this. It's not for me. And because it's okay saying you want to do it, but what time do you get up? What time do you get in? What does it entail? No one knows until you do it. So I wanted to use my last 12 months as a player as almost a preparation for a coach. So I wanted to go in on the meetings with Kenny and Steve Clark in pre-season. And how do you set a training session up? How do you decide who played? You know, all these things that I didn't know nothing about. And then Kenny lost his job. And then Brendan Rodgers came in and he he then had a chat with me over the phone when I was on holiday. And he said he wanted me to be part of his staff, the first team staff, like a, a player coach. And I thought, brilliant, yeah. And, and it would give me 12 months to see, do I want to go into coaching or do I want to go into the media? Because I've always stayed in football. I love it too much. And uh, Brendan said, I want you on the staff. So I, I was delighted. And then he, he changed his mind and brought Mike Marshall, which is, is fine. Uh, so then I just played them and basically told Liverpool or told Brendan the first time I spoke to him, I was retiring at the end of the season. So Liverpool knew my situation and then it got to January, February and I got an offer from Sky and it was too good an offer. It was, it was doing Monday Night Football, which was the big draw, which was to really delve deep into the game. And I hadn't been offered a job at Liverpool and I'm not saying I should have. I'm not complaining by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think it should be jobs for the boys. But I do look at that and think, well, you know, they let myself go, they don't let Stevie go, I think, a couple of years later. And you just think of our experiences, whether that was maybe at the academy or run the academy. I may have said no to that job if I was offered it, but I do look back and think, if, if I was looking at that now and I, and I saw someone else and it wasn't me, because it's hard talking about yourself in that situation and saying, you should have done this, you should have done that. But if Trent Alexander-Arnold basically finishes his career at 35, I'd be looking at and thinking, not there should be a job for him because of that, but you wouldn't want to lose that experience of the club and what it means and what he's done as a player. I'd be thinking, you have to almost find a role for him. And that's when I look back at Liverpool and think, you know, if I was in a position of authority, I wouldn't have let my experience leave and I wouldn't have let Stevie's leave. Stevie may come back. Well, Stevie did come back, actually, for, you know, for, the, for the youth job, but he, he went to the MLS. You may never have got him back. You know, you think of the experiences as, as local players as well for so long with the club. And I just thought, probably a little bit strange to let that go. But it's not something I'm bitter about or think I should be at Liverpool. That's certainly not the case. I, I love the job that I do at Sky. But as I said, that's how it fell. I got offered a really good role at Sky. I got offered a couple of roles in coaching. I said yes to the both of them. But they never materialised. And then it, it's just gone from there, really. Can I, I get what you're saying there. And, and to it. If I'm being honest, I was probably a little bit peeved off that. When I went back to Liverpool, and obviously I was really there for 18 months from uh, 2006 and I left in the end, uh, middle of 2007, and that was probably what I was you know, lingering on for. Maybe Rafa just say to me, oh, well, listen, you're not going to be playing, but 
maybe do you want to start coaching reserves and start building up that way? So I was I was hoping that was going to happen to me. Obviously, what you were saying, he didn't want to chase it. So you feel a little bit embarrassed maybe asking and, and putting it on their toes. I want to do that. Uh, now, what you're saying, it's it's not jobs for the boys, is it? Could you look at Ajax and, and the model and the role, the, the route they go down? It's, it's players who, who've played within the system and they know the club inside out. So it's the old boot room. And, and to a degree, Manchester United are doing it now. Whereas you, you look at the players, they've got uh, I, Nicky Butt uh, is obviously involved. Uh, Darren Fletcher is obviously now part of the um, you know the, the staff as well. So I don't think it's a, it's a case of chasing. It. I think maybe it's 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 not a bad thing for the club to do that and, and I maybe call upon the likes of yourselves, even me to a certain degree, about players who understand the club a little bit more than than maybe an outsider coming in. No, no, I agree what you're saying. No, what, what I mean by jobs for the boys is I, I think. I don't think you should necessarily get a job just because you've worked at the club. I think Liverpool is, is an institution. It deserves the best. And you try and get the best possible people. But there's no doubt we have a huge advantage on other people coming in from outside with our experience at the club. And that's the point with me and Stevie. Who knows if we'd have been good coaches or managers or running an academy. We don't know. But I think to lose the experience initially, I, I think was probably not, not the brightest thing to do. But then as we then go into whatever role it is, maybe just learning the ropes coaching, it may be sport and director, who knows what it what, what that role could have been. And then we could have maybe learned on the job. And if you know what, if we're not good enough, get rid of us. As I said, it shouldn't be, we, we get jobs just be, just because of that. And that's the big thing with Stevie now as manager. Stevie shouldn't get the job of, as manager of Liverpool because he's Stevie Gerrard. He should get the manager of, yeah. of Liverpool because he's been successful or he's doing a great job at Rangers. That, that's what I'm saying. I think we, I think initially you should be given a chance, but, you still then then got to prove yourself in that role because Liverpool deserve the best. Now, Robbie, Robbie knows this, Jamie. I am the chairman of the Brendan Rogers Appreciation Society. I'm a big fan of Brendan. Did he give you a reason? Because I find that interesting. He offers you a position and then doesn't. I, I'm led to believe he's a wonderful communicator. I'd like to think he gave you a reason for offering you it and then retracting it. Well, basically, the, the offer was on the phone. I, I was abroad, so then we arranged to meet in... Uh, face to face and this was in the Hilton Hotel in, in the centre of Liverpool when I got back from holiday and he just said he wanted me more as a player now, listen I don't know whether someone said to him don't have Jamie Carragher he might be after your job I hope we always talk about that don't we of, of uh, you know the experienced pro and a young manager because I think Brendan Rodgers is only four or five years older than me but, but Brendan Rodgers Brendan was light years ahead of me in terms of coaching and managing. Uh, so that had never been the case because he, he started so young and uh, obviously had a bad injury, I think, when he was a younger, you know, youngster. But listen, I don't know, and I'm not in a position then to argue with Brendan Rodgers, and I'm not that type of person to say, well, no, I want to do oh, I would say, okay, fine, you, you know, you're the manager. And I was determined not to become a problem for Brendan Rodgers in, that, in my final year because I actually said to him, I said, listen, don't worry about me or not playing me. Because I'm not, I'm not your best centre back now. I was out the team the year before under Kenny. It was Scale and Aga, and that was right. So I didn't want to ruin my last year at Liverpool. Sort of, you know, arguing with a manager about not playing or putting pressure on him because he's a young manager coming to Liverpool. He doesn't need Jamie Carragher knocking on his door saying, you know, why aren't you picking me or you know trying to be. A, I just said, listen, I'm here to help you, and if you need me for the Europa League games and the Carlin Cup games, brilliant. And and I actually played in those before Christmas, and then. The team had a few funny results and then I actually, I think I finished and played in the last 15 games of the season and we didn't lose one. Uh, oh no, we, in the league, I think did we lose one? I think we lost one game basically uh, in the running and we brought Sturridge and Coutinho and so we almost had a really good second half of the season. So it was a really nice way for me to go out really because I thought I'd go out basically sitting in the stand. So it was nice to play well and, and be in the team towards the end of the season and, and show Brendan what I could do. Cara, what what was the uh, what was the catalyst for the actual retirement? And so you just said obviously the last fifteen games you done well and you came in, but what made you what made you say well I'm retiring? This is the moment because obviously you were still playing well and you were still obviously instrumental in the team and, and within that squad. Uh, I think the fact I played for Liverpool made me retire earlier, and also my position. I think if I was playing with someone else and I wasn't as emotionally invested in the club, I'd have thought to myself a lot more and thought, well, you know what, I can get another 12 months out of this, you know, good wages, play another 15, 20 games. And I see that happen a lot now. You see someone like, I don't know, 
James Milner playing for Liverpool now, he, he knows he's probably going to play 15, 20 games a season, but I, I could never do that. It just wasn't me. I had to play every game. And I, because you know, my you, you know the way I am, Robert, the way I train every day, it's like it's a game and it's almost this build up to a game. And as I said, the year before I got on the team with Kenny, and I never caused Kenny a problem or had a problem with that. I understood. But I thought, would I really leave Liverpool now for the last 18 months and go and play for someone else just to play a few extra games? And you know, how many extra games would I play? These teams wouldn't be in Europe, or you know. And I thought I always wanted to be a one club man. I, I, I never wanted to sort of be in, when I say an embarrassment, I, I used to feel a little bit embarrassed basically when I wasn't playing, when I'd be training with the kids. You know, the day after the game when the lads who've started to do the warm down and you're training with the kids, which is fine, I can help them, but it just, it, it, it wasn't me. And also playing for Liverpool, I never wanted the supporters to think, oh, Jamie Carragher's playing, ugh. You know, that type of thing. And I think, as I said before, as a defender, if you have a bad game, you can cost your team a goal or the game. And I, and I, and I, and I, I did that out of respect for Liverpool fans, really, that maybe I could have played another year. But I thought, no, I, I love the way I've gone out. I've played. I don't want to embarrass myself as a defender. And I only want to play for Liverpool. And I never want the supporters to feel like, Oh my God, Jamie Carragher's playing that type of thing. Where you know, when we, listen, we all think that sometimes when a team sheet comes out and we see it, don't we? We think, oh, he's playing or he's playing. But listen, we're, <laughs> we're fans, we know fans think like that, and maybe they were thinking about like that the last two or three years because you know no one's in their peak in the mid thirties. But I didn't want to get to the stage where I was almost a, an embarrassment or you know just dragging the club down a little bit with my performances. I loved how you just said there, like you were embarrassed that you were embarrassed the next day when you were training with the kids. I was embarrassed the day before the actual games when I knew I wasn't playing. You used to do my head. <laughs> that was good. What, what you just said there was, I mean, I can so relate to it because I, I'm like you. I wanted to play all the time, and that's why I left Liverpool because I, I hated not playing. I hated sitting on a bench. I hated not being part. And and even like the day before games when I, I sort of knew. And I mean, you know, we're obviously with Gerard Hule and when he used to. Like pick a team, or or when they used to pick a training session, um, he never really picked a team. But you sort of knew you were playing by the people you were training with, or when you were doing maybe set pieces. And when you were with obviously some of the uh, some of the Nuggets, you think, oh my god, this is embarrassing. This and that was the day before <laughs> game. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not it's not a good place. I mean, I know what you're saying before the game, but at least in some ways. The whole team's train. It's just that one when I used to find it out when you come out the day after the game, and especially if the team was one, because everyone's buzzing in and like joining. I know the lads are having a laugh, and it's right. You half over there, you go with the fitness coach and do a little warm down, right? You've got, and you don't even train with the manager. You might even train with the reserve manager or one of the coaches. And and listen, it you know those young lads probably if they trained with me or you because of our experience and what we've done at the club, we're delighted. So you've, I'm not saying I didn't try in the games, but I, I always feel when you get older. You want to train less, but when you're not in the team, you're actually training more. And you're yeah. thinking, I'm 35, and I'm like, I'm just doing a warm up, I'm doing a warm down, I'm doing the same possession, same games. When, in fact, what I wanted to do is basically play in the games, do a couple of days train, and then basically be in the pool or the gym and just almost get myself ready for a game. And I just find myself training too much. I wasn't enjoying training and and what went into that and out of it because I wasn't obviously playing at the weekend. That was that's the old uh, Gerard Hooley one, isn't it? You're getting rested this week, but then you do extra training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in in hindsight, though, Jamie, when when you when you look back on the career and, and the year that followed your retirement, does a part of you not think, what if, what if I had given another twelve months, been in and around that squad, because that was the year, of course, that, that Liverpool under Brendan went oh so close to ending. Obviously, it's ended now, the 30-year wait, but it could have happened a few years back. Yeah, that thought was going through my head every week in that morning, thinking, (laughs) what have I done here? Uh, And... (laughs) 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 Some have wanted for so long, what are they going to do with it? I I kept thinking, I'm going to be like Jimmy Greaves. You know, do you remember Jimmy Greaves for not winning the World Cup? Everything else he's done has forgotten because he never played in that World Cup final. I think everyone's going to reach out. Can I remember the year you didn't retire? You won the league, and I'd be like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> you remember? Can anyone mention Istanbul, please? Don't forget it. <laughs> uh, but no, listen, it was a weird one. It was hard to be honest because watching it, I wanted to be involved in it. I wanted the club to win, but you're also sitting there thinking, "I'll be remembered for the year I retired." We won the league, so it was a horrible, 
weird situation. My son was a mass, just it was the, my first season, my son started going to the game and he's like, this is amazing. Uh, you're going to the games, the atmosphere and that. And then obviously what happened to uh, Stevie, your best mate in, in, in football as well. It was just, it, 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 you know what? I was just glad when the season was over, actually, because the emotions of it for lots of different reasons. I have to be honest, it's easy to come on and say, uh, oh yeah, I was desperate for them to win. Half of me was, but the other half of me was thinking, oh, what have you done? You know, so you have to, and, and Robbie and, and other players will tell you that it's a team game, football, we know that. But we always think about ourselves and making sure we're in the team, basically. And and, and even when you, you're not in the team or you get dropped or you're injured, you always want to play in your position, not to play too well. <laughs> you know, you want the team to win, but, you know, you want to get back in the team. And uh, I always tell people that. So it wasn't a, a really... Uh, Strange, funny season where I was. I was sort of glad when it was it was over, really, in some ways. But obviously devastated for obviously what happened on that uh, that, that Chelsea game, really. But yeah, it was uh, it was an emotional ride that season. I have the, just on the coaching to, to wrap up on the coaching theme. Ha, has there been any more approaches, Jamie? And and have you closed the door entirely on it? And I'm not saying don't think for one second. I'm saying you're a bad pundit. You're a bloody brilliant pundit at what you do. But I just think when you when you're so knowledgeable, and when I'm being told that you are someone that really studies the game, I just think to myself, coaching just seems the natural fit. To be honest, I I, I don't think I'd be a good coach or manager. Uh, and listen, maybe a coach, but I think if I was if I was involved in football, I'd have to be the manager because of the way I played the game. I, I don't think I'd it'd have to be my decisions or my way of doing things, uh, really. But management's not just about knowing football; it's, it's managing people, and I think that's where I'd have a problem. Uh, I really do, because I was I was very sharp with my tongue. Basically, when I was a footballer, I was, I'd never hold back on saying anything to anyone on the football pitch because. Winning for me was more important than friendships on a football pitch, and, and winning for Liverpool was more important than anything for me. And I think I'd, I'd probably have a tendency to fall out with people, not because of some of the reasons we talk. Because I'm not a great player, but when we when we talk about great players going into management, they can't understand players not being able to do what they could do. That wouldn't be my problem. I think my frustration would come from the fact that people didn't love football as much as me, and weren't as passionate about our team winning. Really, uh, because I think when I was a player, I used to think like a manager. And if I hadn't played well or we'd lost, I, I think I used to take it more than a lot of players. And that's not saying I, I cared more. I don't mean that. It's just that like I, I constantly thought about football. And if things hadn't gone well, it affected me for two or three days and possibly the way it does affect a manager. And that's certainly not the case with a lot of footballers. I think we all get disappointed, you know, at times. And Robbie will be the same. But I was probably too hard on myself when I was a player. And didn't can I, can I just it? just just to obviously pause you there a second? Is that a good thing or a bad thing though? Because when you're saying you're maybe too harsh on yourself, I know with football and you get you're playing games and they come thick and thick and fast. But you're winning games, you're losing games. But if you're that mentally that mentally drained by you know the way you perform or losing games, how, how does that affect you going into the next game? Into well, it could be as as a player or, or certainly as as a manager. How, how would that affect you? And, and, and Rob, that's why I think it wouldn't be good for me, management. I think that the job would consume me. It would. I mean, football consumes me now. I'm not even a player or a manager. I think about it a lot. Games I'm doing or what you're going to talk about or a newspaper column. So I put a lot into it. And yeah, I had that problem as a player. I did. I saw a sports psychologist for a couple of years about that as well. And I, I could never fix it. And basically, the way I was mentally and, and how tough I was on myself, was what made me the player I was in the end. That's that's what it was. I almost had to go through it. I couldn't be any other way. So the fact I was so tough on myself, if I'd played poorly, we'd had a bad result, meant I would train like a lunatic that week. It'd be on my mind. I, could, I couldn't get the last performance out of my head until I'd played again and played well, really. Uh, and that's why I say I probably didn't enjoy it enough. And I could never forget a bad performance or a bad result. I couldn't be one of those people who just went... I'll forget I'm playing really well. I've, I've had four good games. Just, you know, a bad game, it happens. I, I couldn't. I, it, 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 I, it, I couldn't do that, you know, mentally the way I was. But I was like that as a kid. Yeah. I, I could never sort of... I thought about football a lot when I was a kid. Results used to affect me. And that's why at times I used to lose my temper on the pitch with my own play. I never lost my temper with the opposition or very rarely the referee. It was always my own players, really. Uh, maybe for not performing well enough or not doing enough or not being committed or just that 
frustration that we couldn't win, really. So I was, I, I was maybe not the most popular in the dressing room, certainly on the back of uh, defeats or poor performances for Liverpool, because I, I could get really wound up in a game, and I think that's where I'd, I'd, I'd have a problem with players if if I was managing. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think any, I, I think if I brought any manager onto Monday Night Football. And we were speaking about football and tactics. I would not feel out of my depth, and, and I don't mean I would know more than them. I'd learn things from them. I get that, but I think I could question them. I could probe them. I could understand where they were coming from, and you know, I, I wouldn't feel out of my depth. I'll be totally honest with you, and and, and I'll be honest with you. And I think Stevie will say the same. Now he's doing brilliant at Rangers, but in terms of knowledge of football when we were players, I think Stevie would say I'd have won that hands down. Now it'll be different now because he's had four or five years of, of experience of managing and coaching, which is different in terms of just knowledge of football. There's a lot more to it. But as I said, in terms of knowledge of the game and, and speaking to people in the game, I'd feel very comfortable in any room with any set of people. But there's a lot more to it. As I said, it's, it's managing people, uh, putting teams together, man management. You know, the, the, there's so much more to it. And I'm, 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 I think... I could possibly fall down in those areas just because of my passion for the game. Oh, I thought you were just worried about the stick that Gary Neville would give you. <laughs> you <were laughs> it, 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 it's impossible to get... The, the only good thing about Neville going to Valencia is if I ever go into management, I can't be any worse, so I can only be better than him. So I can't get any stick from him, uh, to be honest. But he's killed any hope of any Sky Pundit ever getting another job, hasn't he, basically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably has, has Gary. I wonder there, talking about your mindset then, Jamie, and the fact that, you know, winning really mattered to you and, and perhaps it didn't for, as you've alluded to, for, for some teammates. Would you tell them, and again, all the years, what was it, 17 years you were a regular at Liverpool, the, the players that perhaps didn't share that, would you pull them up on it? And, and there's, listen, there's a few names I could throw at you that immediately, and there's one in particular who the club decided to choose him over a certain Nicholas and Elka. Uh, someone like him, did, would, would he have been someone who you would have had to have pulled up on a regular basis to say, I'm just not sure whether you actually care whether we win, win lose, or draw come a Saturday afternoon? No, I wasn't, I wasn't someone who'd, uh, in training, I wasn't someone who'd sort of, pull someone and give someone words of advice. I never even really done that with young players and being totally honest. It, it was more actually what went on in the 90 minutes on the pitch. And to be honest, I'm, I'm a big believer of what got said on the pitch stays on the pitch, you know, between opposition players, between ourselves and whatever. But I, I would never carry nothing on with a player or anything like that. Uh, and it wouldn't be like a sit down chat or something like that. It would just be me in a game at 100 mile an hour. You know, the stakes are very high. And it's not a time to be thinking, is this the right or the wrong thing to say to someone? It's right. Boom. Now, sometimes you're out of order. I, I, I almost had a fight on the pitch, didn't I? One of my own teammates, uh, Alvaro Arbeloa, again, over just something really quickly. I've had, you know, slang and matches with, with say, your own players. And <clears throat> as I said, I never got involved with the opposition too much. Or the, the referee, I did actually. But, but no, it was always me, my own teammate in terms of a frustration. <clears throat> Sorry, and uh, <clears throat> no, it wasn't a case of actually having words with people in the training ground or nothing like that. No, it never never got to that stage with me, uh, really. It was just that frustration in the 90 minutes just to try and make sure Liverpool could, could get three points or win a cup game. Can I, you know, when you think about obviously football now and obviously when we were certainly coming through the, the system, if you like, when we were playing, you could give players stick on the pitch or your teammates, you could give them, you know, a bit of a... Nowadays, it's a little bit different. Could you could you handle like not being able to sort of speak to a player aggressively as as a coach or as a manager? Because you, you, in all fairness, nowadays you, you have got to speak to everyone with a little bit of a different attitude than what you would have had to speak to them years ago. No, and, I, and that's why I'm convinced I've made the right decision, Rob. Uh, because I'm an emo emotional person, certainly when it comes to football. When you are emotional, now I think things happen, you know, that you, that you don't want to happen, you look back with regrets. And listen, I'm not saying no coach should ever be able to have a right go at a player or put him in his place now and again, but I think there's a lot less than that. And, and I'm not saying I'd want to do that necessarily. I think that's the right thing to do. I wouldn't want, a, you know, a manager coming into my son now absolutely slaughter at half time, you know, when he's got to go out and play the second half. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. It just, I'm talking sometimes when you're, you're that passionate or you're that emotional about football and you love it sometimes things happen that you don't want to happen and you'll say something to someone you think oh I can't but you say something in the heat of the moment and that's why I think 
me getting involved in, in those situations is probably good that I'm not and I'm doing the job that, that I do because I can still talk about my football, but I'm not as emotionally invested in any club or team. Now, listen, obviously Liverpool, of course, but in terms of, you know, analysing other teams, I, I can take myself out of that sort of pressure cooker of that bubble that we were in for so long playing for Liverpool. And, and, and I like it, to be honest. And I actually like the fact now that, even though it's a little bit different, when Liverpool have a bad result, you do, you do get a bit disappointed, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was when I was a player. And I always imagine what it'd be like now if I was a coach or a manager. And to be honest, that's the thing I, I enjoy about not being involved in football. I feel when things doesn't go well. It's it's a tough place to be for two or three days. And, and I always found it tough to get myself out of those places. So the job I'm in, I very rarely go there uh, with punditry. It doesn't take you to those places. But as I said, it doesn't take you to those highs that you had as, as a player. And maybe some people are having as managers and coaches. I read somewhere you, you talk about um, the fact that you weren't scared to, to have a go at teammates, Jamie. Did Was there a game where you had a go at our other guest, Robbie, and a certain Craig Bellamy pulled you up on it? Is there a story there? <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That I, I didn't have a go at Robbie as such. It was a... Uh, I mean, Robbie was at the other end of the pitch. I was on the halfway line. Robbie must have lost the ball and you're just going, <laughs> Robbie, you know, keep the ball. It wasn't so much at Robbie just speaking out loud. And uh, Craig <laughs> Bellamy was still up front, and he said, uh, "How can you ever go with him? That's Robbie Fowler. You can't lace his." <laughs> you can't go with Robbie Fowler, and I'm very rarely called speechless uh, at any time. Never mind on football pitch. But basically, Bellamy left me speechless, uh, <laughs> and he's probably done that to a few. I'm not the only one, but that was uh, that was Craig Bellamy. I was, I was just so shocked that. An opposition player was talking. To, I mean, I never spoke to the opposition in the game. I don't know, ever. And uh, Bellamy, but he was another good uh, character. I mean, him had a few ding dongs on the pitch. He had um, ding dongs with everyone, him. Don't worry. <laughs> I've heard he was a great trainer, though. That's one thing about Craig. I've heard from various people who up at Celtic, he had a, a massive impact there when he went up and, and spent time up there on loan. He, he he was proper around a football club, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Craig. Get on really well with him now. He, he works with the. Uh, he's a coach in, in Belgium with uh, Vincent Company for the reserve team. He's a huge lover of the game. He's similar to me. He's got real passion for the game. And I think similar to, to Craig, I think that's where a lot of his outbursts came from. The fact that people didn't train as well as him or put as much into it as him because he trained really well. He had a lot of injury problems which he had to do extra work for. He's always been in the gym, looking after different things. So he's a real dedicated professional. And I think a lot of his frustration used to boil over when he'd see players maybe not putting in as much as him. So it'll be interesting to see if he goes into the management game, which I'm sure he will at some stage, and how he actually can control that, because I think it is something we have to control if if he wants to uh, have longevity in that uh, in the culture world. Carol, you know your your, your character, and look, I've, I've known you for years anyway, and I know, I know obviously you, you've come through the reserves, the B team, the U team, uh, and you mentioned before Gerard Hurley in terms of how instrumental he was in, in sort of helping you better your career. What, what, what did he actually say to, to you to sort of get your head down and get a grip of what was needed to be uh, the ultimate professional? To be honest, I think it wasn't just Gerard Hewley. It was, it was growing up as well when you get to that age as well. You know, you sort of early 20s. You're going out with your mates, aren't you? are 18, 19, 20. Gerard Hewley just comes in when I'm 21. And it's not a case of, you know, that just ends completely, but it's just a, a slow down pro, uh, process, really, where you obviously you get me uh, get get together with Nicola, you're going out with the, the lads a little bit less as well. And and just the education of it really and, and starting to understand what alcohol does to your body basically and what you're eating. Really. I mean when you're a young kid you just think, I'll have a few babies with me eight seconds, I'll I'll run it off the next day. But it was people like in the way he used to speak about it, uh, and the things he used to say. And he used to say that that thing he said to himself and Stevie, don't don't go to the nightclub. Buy it when you're finished. Basically, you'll have that much money. You'll be able to buy one. Just little things like that that just stick in your head. But I'm not sure it's a place I want to go when I'm 35, 36, or 43 <laughs> right now, uh, the nightclub. But it was uh, just things like that and what it could do to your body and, and the effect it had on you as well. Uh, and basically, he, he was creating something where he expected players to, to train the way they played. And if you were drinking alcohol of a weekend or you were in the best possible shape, it was going to affect that. It was basically, he wasn't changing. So I felt I needed to change. Now, I don't think, when I say needed to change, I don't think 
I didn't have a drink problem. It was just a normal young lad going out on a Saturday night. But obviously, you're not a normal young lad. You play for Liverpool. And we all know, every player will tell you, you get into a few scrapes here and there because of drink. It always happens. And it's not through any, in, any bad intentions. It's just hijinks, isn't it? Before you know it, someone's done something. One of your mates is involved. And, so, and then you're like, oh my God, how's this happened? You're only trying to have a laugh or a joke. And, and, that, and you know what? And I had three or four instances like that as a young lad. And uh, Julio came down hard on me. And it probably gets to the stage where you're probably thinking, well, <clears throat> is that worth risking me Liverpool career for, basically, you know, going out with the lads and, and things like that. And I'll still go out with the lads later on in my career in different times, but you're older, you're more mature, you, you, get, you make sure you don't find yourself in those situations where, you know, <laughs> happens as it, as it does with the emotional lads on a night out more often than not. And just basically not trying to find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time. I listened with intent on the pod that you guys did on the Greatest Game podcast and, and Rob, it was quite a frank admission from you in actual fact where you said that it really hurt. I think it was your old man that said to you, Rob, had you not drank as much, you might have gone on and, and, and done bigger and better things and you were frank and honest with Jamie on that particular pod and I just wonder, to put that right back to you, Jamie, f- for something similar, what kind of hurt, something that has stayed with you in your career that, that hurt and, and got to the the, the nub of something as Robbie's father's words had for Robbie those years back. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, can, I mean, you just threw that at me. I'm not, I'm not sure I can think of something that. I mean, little things like it's not a big thing, but I think when I, I'm always described as a player, uh, it's, it's always like a hard commitment. And I, and I did say that before, but I think I was a lot better player than maybe given credit for in terms of, you know, passing. I always thought it was a decent pass to the ball. So that's a small thing. But I could understand when you're talking about what Robbie's one's there, that's, you know, something personal with your, with your dad and about something off the pitch. So certainly not nothing uh, like that. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I look at little things and I think where I look back at my career and think, well, I'd love to have played centre-back my whole career. I don't think I ever nailed down the only team I never dominated was the England team basically and I look back at sort of Rio and John Terry who were better than me but I always think what would it have been like if I played centre-back my whole career little things like that well, not, not so much regrets really but just little things I look at and maybe the way I'm described as a player a little bit but it doesn't bother me too much to be honest but obviously that, that situation with Robbie was very open on the, uh, the podcast and, and, and we have things like that and there are things like that pop up at different times with your family because as I know myself now, watching my own son play, I think your family probably feel it more than yourself, you know, when things are going well or not going well. And and and, and Robbie's uh, son plays football as well. And the feeling I get when my son plays well and the feeling I get when he doesn't play well, I feel, it, it probably I'm happier than him and I feel it more than him because you want them to do well so much. So I'm sure Robbie's dad there, was that was coming from a good place. And, I, and just because you're so desperate for your own son, to do well, basically, and, and you know how, how proud he'd been of Robbie, uh, you know, for so many years, banging those goals in for Liverpool. Kind of, that was the reason I brought that up before. But obviously, with, with my dad saying that about you, know, you'd, you'd have been a, be- a better player if you didn't drink. I mean, there's, there's not to say that would have been the case, but that was why I was interested to before about well, obviously Gerard Hule when he got older. You because I had the same conversations with Gerard Hule when I was there, uh, and he obviously tried to get me to you know to, to be sensible and to settle down. But because I'd been a little bit. A little, obviously a little bit older than you, but I'd played in the, an era where players were going out and uh, that was what, and that was just a normal thing. So it was hard for me to adjust with it. I think for you, it was a lot easier. I mean, Gerard Hule did say to us, and one of the phrases he used a lot was, um, you know, if, if your body was a car or, you know, it was a, a Porsche or a Ferrari, you'd put the best fuel in it. But obviously you're going out and you're putting the fuel in it. And that was the phrase he used to use all the time. But I could never sort of get my head around that. And that was what I was alluding to with, obviously, when my dad said it. I mean, it's all hypothetical, of course, but, you know, I might have been a better player. Uh, you know, I might not have been a, um, a better player, but it was what was said. It sort of grates me a little bit because I, I wished I'd have listened, not, not, not to my dad, because obviously this was after, but I wished I'd have listened to Gerard Hurley a little bit more. And look, I mean, I had a lot of injuries. I think, I think it was hard for you though, Rob, and I'm, I'm not making excuses. What I mean by that is you've lived your life in the old way, the early 90s, and you're scoring 30 goals a season. So you're probably thinking, you know, 
I was doing that when I was scoring 30 goals a season. And then I always think a big thing with, when people talk about drink or off the field, I think if you're training every day, it's not the end of the world if you're going out on a Saturday night with your mates and then you train. I think, I think the big problem is injuries. And I was very lucky. I, I was very rarely injured. I played fifth. I played, I had a, over a 10 year period for Liverpool. Nine years out of 10, I played over 50 games in the season. Uh, and the one season I didn't was the season I broke my leg. So I was always fit. I was always training. And I think probably something maybe with you, Rob, you, you'll know better than me, but you had a few injuries. Now, it's probably more of a problem if you, you know, you're a bit down when you're injured. You're not in every day. You're not with the team. And probably sometimes to take the pain away from injuries, I'm not saying you, but you think of, of players in the past, maybe a Paul Gascoigne springs to mind of maybe thinking, you know what, I'll have a few drinks or something. And I think it's probably more of a problem when you're injured. I think having a couple of drinks or what you eat or how you look after yourself because, as I said, you're trying to get your body fit or you're not training as, as hard because you're in the gym or you're at the physios. Maybe maybe that was, you know, something. And I was fortunate that I very rarely got injured, really. Uh, so if I was having a drink or going out for a Chinese or whatever it may be, you're still bladder in your body in terms of physicality of the next two or three days as well. I think, it, I mean, I think what you say there is probably having a little drink was a little bit of a release. And I've never ever told anyone this, but I remember I had an ankle operation. Um, and I mean, I had the operation in a, in a place in Leeds. And obviously it was a modern operation. So we obviously you, you come round, you, you know, the, the operation, uh, the doctors will say, all right, you can go home now. And on the way home from Leeds, my operation, I've got my foot in a cast, I've got crutches on. I arranged to meet my mates in the blue bar in town. That was on the way home from the hospital. And, and, and I think back, you know, wow, what the did I do that for? And it was just maybe just a, a little bit, I don't know why I'd done it. It was just maybe a little bit of a release because you're that getting injured. And I was affected by it a lot by injuries, but I actually done that and I went straight to the pub. Kerry had been bags you had, she? Pro probably. <laughs> <laughs> but how, 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 how bad is that? And I'm thinking, wow, you know what I mean? That, that's, it's, it's a little bit shocking, isn't it? Exclusive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a mindset is is what it is, I guess, in, in a lot of ways. And uh, two penalty shootouts, Jamie, that, that have kind of, I guess, marked your, your career in a lot of ways. Istanbul, it's a well-told story. We're not going to go over old ground there. But uh, someone pointed out to me that as everyone's running to celebrate, I think Dudek saves from Sheva, you sprint off in a completely different direction. Where on earth were you going? <laughs> But basically, that that feeling, I, I, I'd, I'd love to bottle it. I'd love to go. That's that's the greatest feeling I've ever had in, in a, on a football pitch, basically. And it was it was just like an, an explosion in my body. It was just, and there was no way I could stand still. I couldn't have stood still and hugged you. I, I, I needed to run, jump, have this release, basically. <laughs> that's the uh, so I've never seen you that. First. And then I've just, I couldn't stop. I just had to run, scream, shout. And I jumped right over the Hordens, and there was a running track. So I started running on this running track, and it's just one of those mad, crazy freak situations where, where I end up in the crowd, like running into a crowd. It's like, where all my family were? Because it, it's not like an Anfield where you know where your tickets are. When you're playing a cup final, you haven't got a clue where the tickets are or where your family are. It, just, it was just, I've got some great pictures of just being in there with them and my cousin and my brothers. And my dad and that basically, and it was just uh, it was mad, and then a lot of them then joined me basically. But no, I just I couldn't stop because of the energy I had in me and just the, the excitement of uh, of what we just achieved. Rob, you were there that night, and be uh -huh. honest with me, mate. Be honest with me. You as a a Liverpool legend, a Liverpool great. You, your, your time at the club's been and gone. What's your emotion? Obviously, a Liverpool fan, love the club, but what's your emotion? And it comes back to something Jamie said earlier. Are you elated or part of you jealous that you're not part of it? What's the feeling? I think that that element of jealousy, yeah, of course, you want a little bit of, and you want what they're doing. Obviously, yeah, but I, I don't get me wrong, I was absolutely delighted with what was happening. Uh, I think if you'd have gone to the game and don't forget, bear in mind, I've got family and friends there as well. So I'm part of them. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying the occasion. I'm enjoying the moment. A little bit different, admittedly, to what uh, to, to the emotions Cara was doing. But uh, for me, it was just unbelievable and unreal. And I remember our time thinking, uh, I think it could be four or five. It's easy because I thought Milan were absolutely brilliant in that first half. Really was. 
Uh, I mean, we, we won't really go into obviously what happened because we all know, but I'm obviously, I'm hoping like it, it's damage limitations here. I actually don't want to get actually show off the park and that. And, and um, that, that's what it was. So yeah, I was absolutely delighted. I remember going back to the hotel and just starting sing songs. And I mean, obviously back to the uh, back to the old drinking again because we, we, that, we all want to do it. And we were just all delighted and we were all just, I mean, absolutely shattered. I mean, we were shattered as fans. So God knows what Cara was like as as a player. We, I mean, the, the emotions and the uh, the adrenaline was going going mental with us. But I mean, it was just a, an unreal experience. And uh, I mean, one that I, I was glad I was there and I was yeah delighted to be part of, of course, that in terms of a you, fan. you won it, of course, Jamie. But that that Kaka pass for the Crespo goal, it's still I believe the best pass that I've witnessed. I mean, it was unbelievable. It just cut cut you out. And, of course, the stretch, you, you probably have never given it too much thought since, of course, you won it. But what was that Milan team? That that half-time must have been. You just wanted the world to swallow you up. Yeah, like like what Robbie said, I don't think any player going into that dressing room thought we were going to come back. I didn't. I, was actually, I actually walked off the pitch and, and talked about my knowledge of football. I was well aware that Milan had won two Champions League finals or European Cup finals 4-0. So Milan had beaten uh, Stau Bucharest in 1989, 4-0 at the new Camp, and he'd beaten uh, Barca. Barcelona, 94. I think that was in uh, maybe in Athens, 4-0, four, four uh, Johan Cruz, Barcelona. So I'm thinking, going off that pitch, thinking, has anyone won one 5 nil? Has anyone won one 6 nil? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I know, that's what I thought it was going to be. If someone had offered me 3-1, then I had a bit their hand off. If someone had offered me 4-1, I had a bit their hand off, really, because uh, I thought this was going to be like one of them games that everyone remembers historically for the, you know a team getting battered in a final really because we were in a great team and they were the best team in Europe basically so it wasn't sometimes you can be losing a game and it's a bit of a freak and you're 2-0 down to someone you can't believe it and you think oh come on we'll do this second half but they were better than us they proved it in the first half so it's a bit you know where do you go from there really but I mean second half coming out of the big change was Rafa's uh, Rafa's tactical changes and you talk about strengths and weaknesses of a manager Rafa was not emotional he was not emotional at all, but he was very strategic. He was very tactical and he changed the setup with the team basically in the second half. And that made all the difference. It wasn't no motivational speech. It was basically nullifying their threats that, that had killed us in the first half and causing them more problems second half. And you still need a bit of luck and you need someone like Stevie Gerrard to do special things, really. And that, that's, that, that's what it all was. What, what about Cara? I mean, Chris just mentioned there about the, uh, the, the pass. What about what do you remember about and the fact I don't even think Jersey remembers much about it? The uh, the save <laughs> from uh, Shevchenko in the um, in, in extra time or was it extra time? It was extra yeah, time, was, yeah. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> the thing I can remember is the initial header. You're thinking, okay, he heads it, and then it's just one of those moments in time where it felt like the world stood still. And it's almost like waiting for, for uh, Shevchenko to score. And it was almost, I, I, I can't remember it. And he's head, headed it. And I think even when I watch myself running back, because he got in behind Sammy Ipia. So you, you sort of run him back, he heads it. And it's almost like everything just stops. And it, it felt like ages. But then before you know the ball's over the barn, you're like, boom, you sort of, you come alive again, really. Uh, and it's just a moment in time that, that I'll, I'll never forget that. Uh, and I think Andy Gray said on the commentary, you know, you might as well write Liverpool's name on the cup now. But it did feel like one of those moments uh, from that, basically. And it was just, that, that was the big moment. And, I, and I'm convinced that had an impact on the penalties because Shevchenko came into that game as like the best player in the world or the best striker. And it was, and it was a straight part who got the two goals. I think Crespo got two and Shevchenko hadn't scored. And then he missed the chance for them to obviously win the cup. And then in the penalty shootout, he goes up and tries to chip the keeper. And I was like, and if you remember two years before in 2003, he'd scored the winning penalty in the European Cup final at Old Trafford against Juventus. And he ran up and he just smashed it along the floor. And I I almost think, because he hadn't been the star of the show, because he'd missed that chance, did he want to almost show how good he was in the penalty shootout somehow, you know, to, to try and chip the keeper? in the Champions League final, seeing him when you're behind in the shoot, I thought it was a really strange thing to do. Uh, and it, I, I, listen, I don't know, no one will ever know, it might be total rubbish what I'm saying, but I always think was that something in his head to do something clever 
to show how good he was because it hadn't been quite the final and, and he, he'd missed that big chance. Cara, compare and contrast that penalty shootout to, to 12 months, just over 12 months later, Gills and Kirkin, World Cup quarter final. Now, Rob on this podcast has said his relationship with England didn't enjoy it. Good reason for that because he wasn't playing. Proud to play for England, just not playing, therefore didn't get enjoyment. The England, your relationship with England first and foremost, but that penalty shootout as well in Gills and Kirkin. Your thought process in the shootout before, kind of during. And then, of course, after the aftermath, when when you were you were one, unfortunately, of the ones that that missed. Well, we'd be taking penalties in training, and I had missed one, so we'd be talking every day after training. And I always blame that I'm basically taking penalties against Paul Robinson because <laughs> you know, I was never going to miss one. <laughs> Sorry, Rob, I'm only joking. No, but, no you don't. Uh, uh, no, you don't. I got brought on as a sub to take one because I'd been so good in the uh, <laughs> in, in the training and. The mistake I made was basically I'd taken two penalties for Liverpool. And I'd sort of put the ball down, I'd gone back and I just turned and I'd ran and took it. And I did that in this one and scored. And the referee said, I never blew my whistle. And he must not. So you almost had to wait for the referee's whistle. But I just had this mentality, right? I've scored two for Liverpool. I've put the ball down, I'll turn around and I run up really quickly and I put it to the keeper's left. And I did that and I scored. And then I then had to retake it. And then it just threw me head all over the place. It was like, well, the goalie knows I want to go there, so the change, you know, all that. And I just ended up taking a terrible penalty because my head was a bit mangled with, with missing the first one. But it's not something that I dwell on or ever worry about. I didn't think too much about it afterwards, if I'm being totally honest. I'm not a big believer in, oh, he missed the penalty that we lost. I always look back at the, the 90 or the 120 minutes as the reason well, why didn't we win? What didn't we do? Penalties is a, is a lottery, is it? I mean, there's a skill too. When I say it's a lottery, I think you should practice and you try and be as good as you can possibly be, really. But uh, but I didn't blame myself or worry about it too much, if I'm being totally honest. And that is because I think you said it on your pod with Rob as well. And and, and I, listen, I, I'm honest. I'm kind of similar that my club team always, or still does, kind of comes before my country in a lot of ways. That the tribalism of the the day to day weekly of club football always supersedes international football. You were exactly the same growing up, right? Liverpool I, winning a Champions League more important than in England. Hey, I, I can't. I'll just say you know he's talking we're talking about penalties there, right? And then he just then alluded to his club team. I have a guess who he supports. He's talking to me. Yeah, so I'm just talking there. So obviously we're talking about penalties, right? Oh, and who does he support? Yeah, and he's talking about of uh, yeah, yeah. I always think about to my club. He's a big Man United fan. Talking about penalties. <laughs> the penalty kings. The penalty you know, kings. Jesse getting them for West Ham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. He's brought that back here. At least he's scoring for West Ham. He didn't do that much at United. <laughs> no, no. I mean. Uh... Man, you penalties eh, at the moment. Where would they be without Bruno Fernandes? I know. And penalties. No. I know. Did you watch them against AC Milan? You know what? I watched the second half. I was really impressed with AC Milan. I didn't think they'd be that good. You know, we've always got a bit of a downer on the Italian league at the moment or, you know, the last few years with the Champions League. But they were pretty good. And when I seen Zlatan wasn't playing and uh, someone else, I think Mandzukic wasn't playing, I didn't give them much hope. So I watched the second half. I was really impressed with them. I think it'd be a tough one for you to get through that. I think the away goal, uh, you know, going to Milan, it's the old cliche, right? Oof, travelling to Italy, got to get an away goal. It's not set up for Man United now, to be fair. And, you know, you, you think about that, they'll probably finish top four. We've got a wee bet on, do Robbie and I. Do Liverpool finish top four? Are you still confident in that, Jamie? No, I'm not. I, I don't think they will. I think uh, United, City, I think Chelsea will. I think there's one more spot. But I think with Leicester winning in the last minute at Brighton, and us losing at home to Fulham. I think it's going to be tough. And with Leicester being out of the Europa League, I think that's going to be a big help for them as well, to be honest. So I just... If Liverpool perform the way they have done against Leipzig, I still think they've got a chance. But we've seen this Liverpool performance four or five times now, and then we expect maybe two or three games on the bounce, and it's never really materialised in the in the Premier League. So no, I haven't got much hope or faith in making the top four. I think Liverpool have to win the Champions League to be in it. Um, next season but if Liverpool aren't to be in the Champions League I don't want to be in the Europa League either (laughs) (laughs) No Thursday night's never enjoyable never enjoyable so I might have you on that bet Robbie in fairness I might actually win it 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm not really talking about it, to be honest, yeah, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I want to just quickly get your thoughts, and we'll wrap things up, because, Rob, you were making headlines, not for the pod last week, because of your column, free plug to the Daily Mirror. Uh, a few of the other newspapers picked up on your comments about Mo Salah. Does he stay or go for you, Jamie, in the summer? I know a lot of lot's been said and written about his body language and what have you, but... Does Mo Salas, is, is he still a Liverpool player next year for you? Cara, Cara before, before you answer that, let me just say what I said. I just said, basically, look, you know, I, he's I a player. Oh, OK, then. I don't need to say it, then, do I? <laughs> Go on, carry he on. He reads then. everything. I always read your column. Uh, no, I, I think he'll be there for the next few years. And I think he's in a similar situation to a Harry Kane, in that possibly the two best goal scorers in the, in the Premier League right now. And uh, they're at an age where I think no one's going to play big money for them. I think they probably missed the boat if they ever did want to go, whether that's to a Real Madrid or Barcelona, whether it's Harry Kane going to United or City. I mean, for both those players, you're talking 120 plus, maybe more. And I just don't think anyone would spend that much on a, on a players of that age. Now, I think they'd be more looking at maybe paying 200 for Mbappé because, you know, the longevity, maybe the same with Haaland as well, because they get so much more out of them. So I think both of those players are have missed the boat, basically. And also the situation that we're in with COVID and financial finances. And the, the, the two Spanish giants have got no money, basically, and they're massively in debt. So Liverpool wouldn't let Salah go to anyone in this country. And would you want to play for PSG instead of Liverpool? I'd be very surprised if he did with the French league. So, no, I, I think Salah's uh, here to stay. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah. So just, just to obviously finish on that, Chris, as well. I mean, look, look let's be honest. I never said Salah... Should go. Oh, he's backtracking now. No, no, you must have no, a bit of no, stick no, on the social media. No, I get stick out. <laughs> hey, don't worry about that. Hey, so, so what Walls have basically said, look, if, if any player doesn't, regardless if it's Mo Salah, Vinaldo, anyone, if players don't want to be at the club, then sell them. And that, that's the be all and end of it. And that was the same as when I was a player. You know, if, if players don't want to you know, perform and, and turn out and wear the red shirt, then then, then get rid of them. That, that's the, uh, the, the be all and end all. Will, will there be a clear out of any sorts? In the summer, I mean, again, injuries has, has played a part. There's no doubt about that, and and I know a lot's been made of Jurgen's time at Dortmund. That there was a, a climb, they climbed their Everest, and then there was a, a steep kind of decline. You, you're not for one second thinking this is no, the, the I, Malaysia I, set in. I, I, I don't, I don't think there's a rebuild needed at Liverpool. I think there's probably a little few tweaks, uh, but certainly people going about there's a, there's a massive rebuild need to be uh, happening. I, I think that's. I think that's rubbish. That's Man United fans. That's what that is. Yeah, well, they just speak rubbish all the time, Chris. You don't you? Don't you? <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Gary, ne- Gary Neville speaks rubbish. Jamie yeah. Carragher's the main man when it comes to all things. But just on the pundit train, we'll finish there. Jamie, you're obviously loving it. I mean, the one thing that strikes me with you, Jamie, is you you, you don't st- settle for the status quo. You continue pushing the needle. I mean, is that? I mean, what is your view to pundit train and how it should be kind of presented for for us, the watching world? Um, I mean, I think you've just you've got to be yourself. I think you've got to be strong about your opinion. And I think what Robbie's just mentioned then is a perfect example. When sometimes you say something a little bit controversial or or your opinion of something, and people can turn very quickly now, uh, not so much against you, but you know, your social media, everyone has a, everyone has an opinion. And, I, and at this moment, I'm not in Liverpool supporters' uh, good books because of you know my criticism of Liverpool of late. But I think in Punjabi, what you've really got to be careful of is, is getting swayed by people. You know, you've got to, I think, that the pundits I like, you know, they stick to, you know, that's their opinion. Now, you can still be proven wrong or you can be proven right. It, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but, you know, you've, you've got to stick to your guns and not be swayed. I see so many people almost be swayed by people. If they get a bit of criticism, say, if they have a go at someone, if they completely backtrack, then the next time I think, oh, no. So, you know, you know, I mean, I come out with something. I was very critical of Liverpool in the Merseyside derby and said, this is not acceptable to lose in this manner. I don't care about the injuries. They shouldn't be using Vesa Van Dijk as an excuse. And I got a lot of stick of Liverpool fans on my social media for it, for maybe not being more supportive or saying they are valid reasons. Um, but I then qualified it on the, the Monday and, and basically said, if Liverpool fans aren't happy with it, well, they better get used to it because... Uh, the excuse for Liverpool at this moment about not winning the league is, is completely valid with the injuries, but it's not an excuse to lose to Brighton at home and Burnley and Everton at home. And to be honest, what's happened since, I think a lot of, I'm not saying I've been proven right, but I think a lot of Liverpool supporters have now 
almost come round to that opinion in the last two or three weeks because they've then lost to Fulham, Chelsea, Leicester away. You know, these are games that, certainly the Fulham game, even though it was a weakened team, to be fair, but no matter what Liverpool team goes on the pitch, you can't lose six at home. That's just like, it, it can't happen. So even though this team are amazing and we love them and the legends and they'll be, you know, they'll be writing books in the future and we'll be building statues of Klopp or whoever it may be, you know, they're going to be remembered forever, this team. But it doesn't mean you can't be critical of them and analyse them and look at things where they can be better. And as I said, any team, Liverpool team, losing six on the, on the bounce at home, that, that, that's not good enough. And that's why, as I said, I'm not maybe in the good books at the moment. But I think you've got a... I think you've... I think an interesting thing is how you deal with your own club. And that, that's a bit of a problem with Pundity because, say with social media, football now is so tribal. So no matter what I say about Liverpool, if I say something positive about Liverpool, I'm biased. All the other fans say you're biased. And then if I, if I say something negative about Liverpool, I get all Liverpool fans saying, I'm trying to show I'm not biased. And it's a bit like, so in the end, it's, I don't really get that involved in it, really. Uh, because, I mean... People say for the last two or three years, Jamie Carragher is so biased to Liverpool. But Liverpool have been the best team in the world. Or they won the European Cup, they won the league. They've got, they're going a whole season losing one game. I mean, what what bad? There's nothing bad to say. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's amazing, unbelievable. Uh, and now there is something bad to say. And there was something bad to say when Brendan Rodgers was nearly losing his job or his last season at Liverpool. And I said it then. So I think you've just got to be careful. Any new pundits, I'm, maybe I'm passing on experience here in the last seven or eight years, but any new pundits in the game, they've got to, they've got to stick to the guns, basically, and uh, not backtrack when they get a little bit of criticism or what, and stand by, your, stand by your views, basically. And I always like to be the first one to say something, if you like. It's, I don't like reacting to something that's already happened. I like to sort of think, I, I, I can see something happening there, so let's do a piece on this. Um uh, you know, before it happens and everyone's talking about I always like to do a newspaper column maybe a week or two before something big happens or something I can see it happening rather than sort of reacting. But that, listen, you can get that completely wrong or, you know, completely right it if you like. So an example was Stevie with Rangers. So everyone's doing Rangers pieces this week. I did mine last week because I thought, well, if they win and Celtic, I thought Celtic would drop points. So that one worked. Sometimes it doesn't. But little things like that, trying to be ahead of the curve, I think it's just a case of being honest and truthful, Karen, as well, isn't it? I think people see through that, and, and, and sometimes, sometimes people don't like the truth and it hurts. But that's that's the uh, the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the way I look at it, you know, my job is to analyse Liverpool more than anyone else because the, the history, you know, my history with the club. Uh, and some people think you should be more supportive, or you should be a supporter, or some people think you are a supporter. It's just like, it's just the way it is. Gary gets that with Man United. You know, and, you know, it's just, it, you sort of can't win, really. So it's just, it is what it is. Don't get too bogged down and just, you know, as long as you know you're being honest or you're not saying nothing, you know, negative just for negative sake. And, and my perfect example with the Liverpool situation is, if you lose six games at home and I'm, and I'm not being critical of Liverpool, well, what happens when Man U lose six at home or what happens when Chelsea lose six at home or City? And I am critical. So I'm not doing my job right, you know. So you've always got to be mindful of the fact how you treat your own club, and how you treat other clubs as well, because you just get accused of double standards, basically. Yeah, true. It is true. Well, listen, Jamie, uh, we can't thank you enough. Yeah. It's been uh, it's been enlightening stuff, and we've kept you, I think, an hour and a half, which is a new record for the Robbie Fowler podcast. So thank you so much for sparing the time. I know you're a busy boy. You've probably got another five podcasts lined up just tonight. <laughs> <have you? laughs> No, I've got my tea lines up if it's still ready. If it's not, it's, prob it's, pro it's probably freezing now. <laughs> right, Karen, thanks very much, pal. Cheers, Thanks for writing me on the God Pod. Superb. Cheers, Chris. Cheers, Rob. <laughs>